Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. On behalf of BIS Research, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar today on liquid biopsy and emerging frontier in early multi-cancer detection. I'm Ria, Research Analyst in Healthcare Precision Medicine Vertical at BIS Research, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. BIS Research is a leading global market intelligence research and advisory company that focuses on emerging trends in technology which are likely to disrupt the dynamics of the market. The mission is to harness the potential of disruptive technologies to make business thrive in today's digital age. Am I audible? Uh, yes, we, are, we can hear you. We are addressing okay, the okay. issue at Aziz's end. Please continue. OK, sure. Uh, so for today's webinar, we have a speaker from Yale School of Medicine and another one from our one of our own speakers, uh, Mr. Nitish Kumar. Firstly, we have Dr. Azit Narayan. He is a visiting faculty in Yale School of Medicine, formerly associated with Semaphore as their principal scientist. His main interests lie in developing sequencing-based innovative diagnostic assays to enable ultra-sensitive detection of nucleic acid biomarkers in clinical samples. These high-throughput, inexpensive yet simple technologies find their applications in early diagnosis of cancer, monitoring treatment response, and also as a primary endpoint point for clinical trials. His trials, his research interests include diverse fields of physical and biochemical sciences aimed at achieving realistic diagnostic solutions for challenging diseases. Also, we have with us Mr. Nitish Kumar Singh, Principal Consultant for Healthcare Precision Medicine practice at BIS Research. He has a successful track record for consulting Fortune 500 clients in the biopharmaceuticals and life sciences domain. He also has expertise in handling projects related to consulting market research with focus on biopharma, life sciences, and biotechnology. Additionally, he is experienced in preparing epidemiological-based data models for biopharmaceutical products. I thank both of you for your gracious presence in our webinar today. So let's discuss the agenda for today. We'll start with Dr. Azit Narayan taking over to talk about the benefits of liquid biopsy and explain his clinical study at Yale School of Medicine. Then I, Ria Gupta, will start by explaining the key trends and market developments going on in liquid biopsy right now. Uh, then Mr. Nitish Kumar will take over to discuss the market dynamics of liquid biopsy and extracellular vet vesicles-based liquid biopsy. In the next 40 minutes, we are all keen to learn from your experience with liquid biopsy in multi-cancer detection. And towards the end of the discussion, I'll open the panel to the audience for your questions. I would like to request everyone in the audience to kindly mute your phones during the webinar and type in the questions towards the end of the webinar. Any questions that we are not able to answer today will be reverted in a blog post or via email. So now I would like Azit to take over the call. So Azit, over to you with your thoughts. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Um, I'm not able to uh, gain access to it. Uh, uh, tried logging in through my uh, Teams, but I wasn't. Uh, I was not audible. Uh, nothing I could hear as well. Uh, so I logged in on web uh, web base. Um, sorry. Uh, so you will have to navigate the slides. Uh, I'm not able to get the control of it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. You can just say next, and I'll move to the next slide. No okay. Sure. Uh, hi. Sorry about this uh, technical glitch with. <laughs> Um, so um, greetings to all. Um, thanks for joining uh, here on this webinar. Um, and I really appreciate uh, Ria, your efforts and Nitish for uh, inviting me and giving me uh, uh, opportunity to present the work here. Um, so um, here's the title of my talk today, uh, Circulating Tumor DNA as Early Cancer Biomarker. Uh, majority of the work that I'm going to present here is done in Yale and past uh, 12 years. 
Uh, and the presentation would entail mostly uh, DNA fragments that circulates in the blood. Uh, I'm not going to present the aspects of uh, exosomes or uh, circulating tumor cells that also circulates in the blood that sort of makes a whole part of the uh, gamut of liquid biopsy. Um, so uh, with this, I'll, I'll get into the details of my talk. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so cancer, as we know, is caused by the alteration in the genome. Um, and uh, next slide, uh, uh, Ria. Um, and you can see in this cartoon here, uh, all kind of cancers have alterations, some sort of mutations uh, in the, their genome. So right, right from the pediatric, the uh, kids uh, cancer or adult cancer, you can see the all the cancer that are mentioned here and the brackets actually shows the number of mutations, alterations uh, uh, that that kind of cancer uh, tumor uh, uh, when it was sequenced was shown to have those uh, mutations in those. So you can see among the pediatric cancer, you have very few numbers, but as you see in the adults, those numbers grow higher and you see more numbers in the cancer that sort of are the organs that are exposed to environment. For example, lung cancer, you see a single tumor can have 147 mutations non-small lung cancer have 163. So you see those numbers going up and also it sort of depends on how frequently uh, the uh, turnaround time in, of the cells are, how quickly they regenerate, that numbers also, the mutations also acquired by those uh, tissues uh, grows higher. Next slide, please. Um, so what you see over here in this graph is, these are adapted graphs from a publication published by both Google Streams Group and Johns Hopkins. Uh, what you see over here is majority of the alterations are translocations, deletions, amplifications, in insertions, deletions, and single base substitutions. And among all these vari variations, what you see is single base substitution uh, constitutes the most numbers um, in all kind of cancer. That's true. Uh, not just these uh, four or five uh, alterations, there are also uh, uh, Epigenetic changes, uh, like uh, um, uh, 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 your uh, DNA methylation can also get uh, uh, disrupted, uh, like hypomethylation and hypermethylation of various regions. So those are, I'm not going to detail and talk about those, but mostly I'll be concerned in my presentation about the single base substitution and the technology that we developed to detect those uh, single base substitutions. Um, so once we know that there are these alterations that exist in this cancer, they are different from the normal tumor. Uh, what we needed is an access to those alterations. And next slide, please. Um, so once you, uh, uh, and the way you could get access to is by uh, gaining the access to the tissue that is altered. Um, but the access to the altered content is limited by its access. The, uh, uh, mostly it's done by the uh, tissue biopsy, tumor biopsy by uh, a painful procedure of uh, inserting a needle all the way to the tumor point and sucking out a few cells and some part of the tissue. And then looking at it uh, morphologically or by just sequencing that to get to know what the change is in that. But as I said, it's a painful uh, and risky um, and sort of poses threat to the patient uh, of various kind of and requires a specific, uh, very specialized personnel to sort of do that. Um, and many a times it's, uh, unaccessible. Uh, for example, if the tumor is somewhere in brain or it's not well categorized tumor, uh, it's hard to sort of uh, get the tumor biopsy done there. So uh, their alternatives were always looked upon. Uh, so alternative sources uh, were bodily fluids. And with the advent of PCR, we knew that the tumor sets its DNA in the blood um, and those can be detected, but the PCR-based methods were limited in its nature in the sense that you could look at very few mutations. Uh, you could not scan through the entire genome and see what all mutations exist in a tumor. So the, it remained a uh, uh, limited uh, uh, of uh, the t sort of biopsy, the fluid biopsy or the liquid biopsy, which the term got coined in late 2014-15. Uh, uh, but earlier uh, uh, PCR-based methods were limited in its scope. So, um, um, so next slide, please. So uh, I'm just going to tell you why we want to sort of look at uh, nucleic acid biomarkers rather than the protein biomarkers, which already exist. So uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so when your tumor is big, uh, uh, you get these protein biomarkers. These protein biomarkers, cancer also, the cancer tumors also release protein biomarkers. There are many protein biomarkers. Um, and But these biomarkers are also not, they are not biomarkers alone. They are uh, produced in general in, uh, uh, in our body by various uh, tissues. They are uh, of use. Uh, but when you have a tumor producing that, uh, a big tumor, the tumor derived content is pretty high uh, and it's above background. So it's easier to find that out, distinguish it from the normal. And then you can detect it as a tumor uh, marker. But when, uh, next slide please. When the tumor is pretty small, uh, it's very hard to distinguish the signal, the content that is coming out of tumor uh, and to uh, uh, distinguish it from the background becomes really difficult. So it, it sort of uh, makes it much more difficult to figure out whether you have a cancer or not, or not just that, if you would just want to monitor that as well, it becomes really difficult to sort of monitor over the background. But advantage with nucleic acid biomarker is, next slide please, um, that there is no physiological background, very low physiological background because it's an altered content. So if you, if there is any altered content uh, and you are able to sort of see it, detect it, then it is coming from a tumor somewhere that in your body um, because uh, there is no physiological, virtually zero physiological background, but there are technical backgrounds. If, so if you could overcome the technical backgrounds to detect it, you should be able to detect that and be, make a uh, call about uh, whether it's a, a tumor or not. So that's where uh, the uh, new, uh, circulating mutant tumor DNA uh, is more, uh, uh, becomes more important because it's, it, it, there is uh, virtually zero physiological background and making a call becomes very certain. So next slide, please. Also, the uh, sort of uh, uh, liquid biopsy gives you an advantage over the tumor biopsy is that it sort of uh, uh, captures the mutation heterogeneity, heterogeneity that a tissue biopsy could miss. For example, if you have tumors all over the body, and if you are just taking a tumor biopsy from one tumor, you won't know what is the characters of the other tumors in your body elsewhere. So liquid biopsy gives you an opportunity to sort of scan through the entire tumor uh, gamuts, which exist across the body. Next slide, please. So um, with all these advantages that uh, liquid biopsy throws us upon us, uh, there are many challenges as well. For example, the tumor DNA that we get in blood is highly fragmented. So any, any DNA that you have, majority of the DNA, not just any DNA, majority of the DNA that you see in uh, uh, blood, separating in the blood is uh, very fragmented. Majority of it is 160 base pairs. Uh, it's, uh, it's the DNA that survives, uh, uh, re remains in the blood, and it has a very short half-life of around 30 minutes to uh, two hours. Uh, still, debate is on about that. Uh, and uh, it's a 60 base pair, very rare amount of, very little amount of DNA circulates in your blood. Uh, around uh, if a healthy person is there, uh, he, he or she may have just few nanograms per mil of blood. Uh, and in uh, uh, metastatic cancers, you may get in 100 nanograms per mil of blood. Uh, and the next uh, other big challenge for uh, uh, detection is the rare mutant copies in the wild type background because the mutant DNA that is, is coming from tumor is pretty small in amount while you have large amount of wild type DNA that is coming from the uh, death of white blood cells or epithelial cells or various kind of other cells that are always continuously being uh, dying and releasing their content as well. So you have to distinguish the mutant versus the wild type, which is a single base substitution or some sort of deletions or insertions it becomes very difficult. Next slide, please. So um, it sort of is a similar situation where you have a needle in a haystack problem, where uh, if you sort of throw a needle in the haystack, how do you find that needle from that haystack? So. Uh, traditional uh, ways of sequencing wouldn't be able to do that. For example, Sanger sequencing, because it looks at the batch sequencing. So what you needed is a technology that could go through every hay in the stack. So if you have a technology that can go through each hay in the hay stack, then you will be able to, in, you can ensure that you will find the needle as well, because now you're not going in a batch manner. So that's where, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's where we sort of uh, uh, hopped on to this technology very early in its uh, uh, advent, uh, the next-gen sequencing, the deep sequencing technologies, where Illumina came up with this uh, paired-end uh, sequencing technology. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, 
uh, uh, description of what ultra deep sequencing uh, of rare variants is. So what you do is basically if you have a mutant, you know where the mutant sites are because cancer, uh, lot many tumors have been already sequenced. So we know what the tumor uh, mutations are, what are the causes of uh, uh, the, what are the mutations that causes a cancer. Um, so you can span and design the primers pretty close to those hot spots or warm spots, amplify that. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and then once you have amplified, you can throw it on deep sequencers, the next gen sequencer, for example, Illumina's sequencer. So what you can do is because you are going through each molecule that is present in that sample. So you should be able to see the altered one as well, specifically, because the wild types ones will look like wild type, the altered one that is one of them, a rare one should also be visible to you. But next slide, please. Um, but what happens is when you do these uh, library preparations uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, extraction of DNA, you damage the DNA and those damages look mimic uh, your uh, altered content. It, they look like as if they are coming from the tumor. So what you need to do is to, you don't have physiological background as I so, showed earlier in the cartoon. Uh, what you have is a, a technological background. So we needed to come up with the ways to remove these technological backgrounds that our technologies were throwing out, like next gen sequencer itself. They were highly prone to uh, these kind of uh, uh, um, sort of sequencing errors is what is called. PCR also introduces errors. So um, those may mimic our uh, real tumor uh, altered content. So next slide, please. So uh, what we came up with uh, is a, a very uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of we applied our uh, approach on uh, using this Illumina sequencing. Uh, so what, uh, so there were many other sequencers, but we used uh, Illumina sequencers because they had this very prop, uh, unique feature in their sequencing. They used to do, uh, 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 next slide please. They used to do this. Uh, so what they do is they uh, sequence. Uh, you could sequence early on. You could sequence 500 base pairs. So you put, uh, you have your uh, DNA. You add their adapters, and throw it on the flow cell. And you can sequence from one side, uh, 75 base to 150 base pairs. And from uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then you can come back and sequence the same same molecule from the other side, five prime to three prime. So basically, you could get paired end sequencing. But this since was not overlapping. So it, what it would give you is a context of the same molecule as what the uh, you could assemble the genomes. It's, this was called short uh, read sequencing. But what we did is basically use this to our advantage. Next slide, please. And uh, designed our, uh, uh, um, our primers pretty close to the mutation sites. So, uh, so that we could do an overlapping sequencing. So basically if we do the sequencing from uh, three prime to five prime and then do the reverse, uh, the paired end sequencing and get the five prime to three prime sequence and let them overlap. So the idea was that the probability that the sequencer will make the same error on the same site is highly unlikely. It becomes the square of that. So that way we thought that we should be able to reduce the errors that sequencers were making. So, so that way we could reduce the phys uh, technological backgrounds that were coming in our essays. So uh, we patented this technology. Um, next slide, please. Uh, um, so you see how we are going to so, uh, read, uh, reading from one side. So uh, we are sequencing through the mutation side. Uh, next slide, please. And then we sequence it back. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So it's, it, you see the other side, it's coming and overlapping. And so you just uh, all, uh, uh, match the two reads and throw out any reads that are not uh, coherent with each other. Um, so that, that's how we were able to reduce all the sequencing uh, uh, errors that sequencers were making. So this we call a clonal overlapping period in sequencing. Next slide, please. So we use this technology and I'll just show you an example how it sort of uh, helps us in reducing the technological uh, 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 errors are, uh, that were introduced by the sequencer. So this is a uh, uh, data uh, where uh, what we did is spiked in a KRAS mutant at 0.2%, pretty low. I mean, back then it was impossible to sort of detect those low levels uh, uh, with Illumina sequencers uh, with their traditional ways. Uh, so, um, uh, so you see here, uh, what we did is basically took a wild type D, uh, uh, cell line and added 0.2% KRAS mutation where the the G, the first uh, on the codon 12 G, G, T, the first G is uh, replaced by an A. So what you will see over here is we did the, uh, applied our sequencing uh, technology that we developed and uh, did the read one sequencing. And we saw that, uh, uh, can you uh, go to the next slide? 
So that is the real mutation that was supposed to be there. But what you see is other towers as well. Those are the sequencer introduced errors. So it's very hard to distinguish whether which one is real or and just to remove the others. I mean, you couldn't call that those are not real because they are very significantly there. But when we applied our uh, clonal pair, uh, overlapping paired and sequencing, next slide, please. Uh, what you see is uh, we were able to suppress all other TARs and were able to see the real uh, GGT to AGT variant uh, in our sequencing run. So we were able to significantly suppress the uh, sequencing errors that were made by the sequencers. Why we needed is because, as I so showed you in an earlier cartoon, that the, these are the tumor derived content is very rare. So you wanted to sort of see it at very low levels, remove all the technological uh, uh, sequencing of PCR introduced error. But still what you see over here is some errors are there that are very insignificant, but they are still there. And you cannot make a call at that low level. But we have overcome those. Uh, I'm not going to present those slides here, but uh, there are ways to remove those as well. So next slide, please. Um, so, uh, our, uh, so I'm going to sort of present you uh, data of uh, this essay that we had developed uh, in 2011-12. Um, uh, and we published this paper in Cancer Research. Uh, uh, this is the second paper actually uh, showing next-gen sequencing uh, uh, technology uh, in, in, in introducing next-gen sequencing technology for liquid biopsy. Back then, the term itself didn't exist. The liquid biopsy term didn't exist. Uh, so some of the data that I'm going to present is from that those uh, those uh, and that study. Um, so we had this panel of uh, 26 genes in our panel, uh, 23 genes and 46 different regions of those that we were uh, looking at in the panel. Um, next slide, please. Um, so with this essay, I'm going to show you the results of some of the uh, some of the findings that we had. So next slide, please. Um, so what you are seeing over here is a. Uh, 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 as early stage clinical case, uh, a female lady, 75 year old, frail lady, uh, had a, a stage one adenocarcinoma. Imagine, it, it's, uh, understand the significance of this. Is this is a stage one cancer patient who had a localized tumor in her lung, um, and it measured 2.9 to 2.5 centimeter. It had KRAS mutation, but I was blinded to it. So when I performed my assays, we didn't know that this patient had a KRAS mutation. We just blindly applied our assay and we were able to sort of detect. Next slide, please. Uh, so what you see over here is I'm plotting my ctDNA uh, findings in the plasma. So per mil of plasma, how many ctDNA we are seeing. So, we, so what we are seeing is a KRAS glycine to arginine mutation uh, per mil of plasma. So uh, next slide, please. So we uh, took the uh, sample uh, pretreatment and measured before the, uh, so this patient underwent uh, radiation. It's called stereotactic body radiation therapy because it's an old lady, could not undergo surgery. Because stage one, you can do surgery and remove the tumor. But because you are so old, you can, the surgery cannot be performed. So what you do is uh, you give huge uh, radiation dosage, very localized uh, uh, to that site and blast it off. So we took the patient plasma before the radiation was given. And what you're seeing over there is uh, the highlighted thing in the red circle is before radiation was given, we are seeing four or five molecules of KRAS mutation per mil of plasma detected through RSA. And then once the uh, next slide please, once the radiation was started, uh, you see a spike because the tumor cell, tumor is dying, releasing its content in blood. And what you are seeing is measuring those uh, high amount of DNA in the blood. So we were able to see with this technology, stage one cancer. Next, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so in the uh, pretreatment versus five month post, you can see the scan, how the tumor sort of shrank significantly and we were able to monitor that on CT scan. Go ahead, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so it's a clinical case. So it's another uh, clinical uh, case of a patient who had a non-small cell lung cancer and this patient eventually died. And what I'm just trying to show over here is that we were able to monitor the progress of progression of the disease uh, through our assay. Um, uh, the patient had very low levels initially, but as it grew, the tumor spread all over, it became metastatic, and uh, this patient died, uh, diseased, and we were able to sort of follow that on RSA, how the tumors were metastasizing or progressing. CTDNA was increasing. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, another case, clinical case, where we were able to show that uh, we could monitor the emergence of re uh, resistance. So, uh, so you know how uh, if you have a, a lung cancer and you are, and if you have an EGR, uh, AGFR mutation, uh, you undergo a, 
a personalized medication called uh, erlotinib, which sort of targets uh, these uh, uh, AGFR mutants. But in general, within a year or so, they develop resistance uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, sort of some mutation happens at T790M in the EGFR region uh, that doesn't bind with the, uh, this drug anymore and gives the resistance. So we were able to monitor that as well we're using our uh, essay that um, uh, how uh, the patient developed resistance and we were able to see those mutations uh, appearing in the tumor of those patients. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, that the those are the points that you were seeing uh, where the mutation was. So uh, this is a very interesting case that I'm trying to show you here. Is a this is a patient who uh, it's a 66 year old male uh, had a local locally advanced unresectable pancreatic cancer. Uh, it was uh, this patient was treated with chemo chemo chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And then there were two PET scans done for this patient. Uh, PET scan was done, uh, first was done at nine weeks, showed no evidence of disease. And then another PET scan was done at 3.5 months after three and a half months and showed a recurrence of the uh, recurrence in the liver and pancreas. The uh, tumor was seen there. But you see in the scan one, uh, you do not see any tumor there. But you, next slide, please. Just click. But what we are seeing in that is uh, in our essay, we were seeing around that. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and, and, and at, at that stage, nine weeks, even though you don't see any tumor in the in the patient uh, scan, but we were in our essay seeing a uh, KRAS mutant, frag some fragments of KRAS mutant we were seeing already in that uh, patient blood uh, when we performed our essay on that. Um, so, and then next slide, please, go ahead. When, and in scan two, when you are able to see the mutations, uh, sort of tumors appearing in the uh, uh, liver and pancreas, uh, we were seeing huge amount of that mutation in the patient blood. So what you're seeing over here is we, uh, the essay was sensitive enough to detect it before it can be seen on the radiation uh, CT scans. So, uh, the, so that sort of gave us really good uh, uh, idea of how sensitive the liquid biopsy can be um, uh, and uh, can detect things before uh, you can see on images. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, after having uh, uh, tested success with this technology, we wanted to sort of use this technology for uh, monitoring uh, 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 some sort of uh, clinical trials. And we enrolled ourselves in a, a clinical trial that was happening in Yale uh, School of uh, Yale, um, Yale Hospital. Uh, what they were doing is uh, treating lung cancer patients with immunotherapy, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So why we wanted to, to use this technology in this particular patient cohort is because uh, for lung cancer, the way to measure the uh, tumor progress or uh, resection is by doing some CD scans, images and physically measuring how big it grew or how small it uh, shrank. So we wanted to see if we can apply our technology and see if ctDNA can monitor that more efficiently. So next few slides, I'm going to sort of show uh, to impress upon you that how liquid biopsy helped us uh, gain much earlier access to the uh, information uh, about what to do with these patients. So. Um, so the challenges in accessing immunotherapy, uh, immunotherapy efficacy are numerous. So for example, the predictive biomarkers that, uh, that are used uh, uh, for uh, sort of uh, monitoring this protein biomarker is pdl one expression, which is highly uh, dubious in nature. It, uh, it doesn't correlate directly with uh, the expressions do not correlate directly whether the patients are benefiting or not. Um, uh, um, also uh, immunotherapy, produces a unique sort of radiographic response patterns in these patients. For example, when you start immunotherapy, the tumor tends to shrink very slowly. Uh, and you see a very prolonged st tumor stability without much clear response. So um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and there, are, there, is a, uh, there is a sort of a unique situation that arises is a pseudo progression. So when you start immunotherapy, so in you, you, you see on the baseline, the, these four among the four images that you are seeing in front of you, uh, the first image is baseline before immunotherapy was started. This is an adapted um, uh, picture from other publication just to sort of emphasize on what pseudo progression is. So what you see in the first baseline image is uh, a tumor encircled by the red uh, circle uh, as, uh, as, as a baseline image. And when it's uh, sort of immunotherapy was started, what you see is a growth of that tumor. That's called pseudo progression. 
because what happens is when you start immunotherapy, the immune cells infiltrate the tumor region to clear it out. But what on the image, if you take, it looks like as if it has grown and it's a 12 week from the baseline. Um, so a clinician doesn't know whether it has, it is really affecting the patients or not, uh, whether treatment is successful or not. So that they have need to make a call whether to suspend the, uh, uh, the immunotherapy or to continue on therapy. So you need to make that decision at that point. So if you see it's uh, growing, you just take the patient out. But what you see over here is in the 24th week and 52 week, the tumor shrank significantly. So basically, if you had taken uh, the patient off from the therapy, it would have uh, been a detrimental thing for the patient. So what you want to do is make a call very early on these patients, whether they are being impacted by the therapy or not. So next slide, please. So I'm um, going to sort of give you uh, and uh, go ahead, next slide, um, uh, sort of end of what we did here. So we uh, recruited 49 patients, continue to uh, uh, click uh, Ria. Um, so uh, of those 49 patients, we uh, our SA was able to see uh, mutation at baseline in these 28 patients. Then we, uh, in, those, uh, in all these patients, we did uh, took the radiographic and CTDNA measurements. Uh, and the immunotherapy begun. So once we had confirmed that uh, what mutations are there and how many patients have the mutation that we could follow through our uh, essay, we uh, begun the immunotherapy. And then we started measuring the radiographic risk assessment and as well as uh, collected serial plasma to perform our uh, circulating tumor DNA analysis on those. The radiographic risk assessments were made by the radiologist while uh, um, uh, uh, we were making our own uh, CT DNA. So quickly go to the next slide, please. I'm going to present you the data as how CTDNA was better uh, in terms of, uh, it was mostly, uh, uh, it followed what we were seeing in radiation, uh, radiographic images, uh, uh, and but it, it showed better uh, results in some cases. So next slide, please. So what you're seeing over here is a graph plotted uh, of CTDNA patients uh, were responders versus non-responders. So radiographic progression, uh, so what you're seeing over here is a CTDNA uh, amounts in radiographic responders. You can see that uh, the ones that responded really well in radiographically had very low or uh, almost zero CTDNA content, while the non-responders, their CTDNA contents were all over the place. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, what you're seeing over there is the transient spike in many tumor cells as they die, uh, because as I showed you in an earlier uh, stage one cancer patients as well, when you uh, cells die, they release their content in blood. And if you are able to spot at that moment uh, in your essay, you will be able to sort of see that spike and then it comes down to zero because of the half-life. Next slide, please. Uh, what I have present, uh, sort of this graph is plotted over here to sort of show you uh, uh, how much CTDNA goes down uh, in responders versus non-responders. So in responders, the CTDNA quantity is almost zero, while in non-responders, the CTDNA values tend to be all over the place. Next slide, please. So what you see over there is that those two dots, those two patients were, uh, the CTDNA values were pretty close to zero, like as if they are responders, but according to CTDN uh, radiographic uh, images, the, the, the clinicians had called them, uh, the, the radiologist has called it a non-responder, but according to CTDNA, they look like as if they are responding to it. And the evidence, clinical evidence has manifested that. Next slide, please. So what you're seeing over here is a correlation of radiographic responders and CTDNA responses that we were measuring in these 28 patients. So uh, as I said, mostly uh, radiographic responders and CTDN responders were similar, but there were a couple of cases where uh, the, they, they differentiated from each other. Next slide, please, just click. So what you see over there is uh, these three were the discordant results that we were seeing. We called as from our essay that these, were, these patients were responding to the therapy, immunotherapy, while the uh, radiographic uh, radi radiologists call them as non-responders. Uh, they showed that the tumor was growing, but as as per our essays, uh, we were seeing that uh, they were responding to therapy and they should not be taken off from the study. And clinical data actually manifested that the clinicians were seeing that these patients were deriving benefits from the immunotherapy, so they should not be taken off. So that's where the uh, CTDNA it, it gives you a better idea, clinical outcome of what's happening with the therapy. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, after seeing this, uh, uh, what we wanted to sort of see is, are we able to make the calls before radiographic risk uh, response? 
So those 10 patients who are showing uh, CTDNA and radiographic responses, uh, they were coherent. We took those patients and then looked at how quickly we could, we could make a call whether these are uh, benefiting from the therapy or not. So next slide, please. So when we plotted the timings of a response of uh, these 10 patients, uh, uh, what we see is uh, the CTDNA responses were seen in 24 days while the radiographic responses were made on 72 days. So basically there was a huge difference. So you had to wait for th that long uh, to make a call whether these patients were benefiting from the therapy or not. So CTDNA is much, much quicker, much earlier in terms of giving you an idea as whether to continue with these patients or not, as I showed you in one of the cartoons where how important it was to make a call early. Go ahead, next slide. So what we see over here is, uh, so CTDNA responders uh, were uh, benefiting long terms. Uh, so, so median treatment uh, duration for the CTDNA responders was uh, seen to be 205 days, while non-responders uh, were just 69 days. Uh, so uh, those big patients who were deriving benefits uh, um, lived longer and CTDNA responders, uh, CTDNA measurements showed that that uh, the CTDNA responders uh, stayed on treatment for much longer than the non-responders. Go ahead, next slide. And this is a Kaplan marker sort of to sort of show you, show you uh, the progression free survival or overall survival as well. So sort of you can see that the CTDNA responders uh, clearly differentiated itself from the non-responders. They lived much longer. Uh, uh, and progression-free survival and overall survival plots sort of shows the same results as the CTDNA responders were benefiting more uh, from the therapy, while non-responders, those who did not respond to the treatment therapy, uh, did not um, uh, show better results with overall survival or progression-free survival. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, what we can say is that the, uh, the question that can we monitor tumor, tumor cell death in real time by quantifying changes in circulating tumor DNA levels enable early assessment of immunotherapy efficacy for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. So the results were that, um, yes, we can uh, measure the treatment response, we can, and it sort of shows better, uh, 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 sub, uh, better response uh, uh, in terms of radiographic responders versus CTDNA responders, if you were to look at. The CTDNA response were much drastic, much clearer, uh, much quicker. Uh, and patients derived much longer treatment benefits uh, who were showing CTDNA responses. Uh, and uh, CDN responses were associated with improved progression-free survival and overall survival. So in conclusion, we can say that a drop in CTDNA level is an early marker for of uh, therapeutic efficacy and predicts prolonged survival in patients tre tre treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors in non-small cell lung cancer. And it is true. I mean, we have seen in a lot many other cases uh, where CTDNA uh, has shown a much better uh, uh, the responses, uh, efficacy, uh, and uh, early detection uh, can be made through liquid biopsy processes. Next slide, please. And with this, I would uh, sort of uh, take the uh, time to acknowledge people who helped me in this studies, these studies. Uh, Abhijit Patel was the mentor, who is a professor at Yale in the School of Medicine, and the other three, uh, Chaitanya, Trin, uh, and Dennis, were uh, co-workers with me. Um, um, then bioinformatics help from Samit and Nicholas Carrero. Uh, oligos were used from Joseph. And there were many collaborators, clinical collaborators. We had uh, Rai Hulse, Troy Decker, um, and many other players, people helped me in this. Uh, next gen sequencing was done at uh, uh, YCGA, a core facility provided by Yale to us. So with this, I'll say uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and we'll be happy to take any uh, questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Asi. Uh, that was very insightful. Now we'd like to, uh, I'll start the presentation from BIS Research uh, that Nitish and I will be the key speakers for. So uh, any questions you have for Asi, you can hold on till the end of the call and then you can type in the questions when I open the panel to the audience. Uh, so I would like to start with the key trends of the market uh, of the liquid biopsy and the market develop, development that is going on in liquid biopsy right now. 
So let me start with explaining what liquid biopsy exactly is. So as you all know, liquid biopsy is a non-invasive procedure that uh, detects the presence of molecular cancer biomarkers in biological fluids. Due to this, liquid, liquid biopsy makes it easier to detect cancer at early stages. And for some cancer like lung cancer or in, where invasive biopsy procedures are very hard, liquid biopsy can revolutionize the way course of treatment is planned, where multiple cancer blood draws can easily be done uh, to see the cancer progression. Over here on the image, we can see the key advantages and challenges of liquid biopsy. Liquid biopsy is non-invasive, uh, can detect early cancer, high throughput, and can provide personalized therapy. A few challenges that we face with liquid biopsy are complex variants, tumor heterogeneity, tumor low tumor DNA shed, and lab-specific biases. But these challenges are expected to overcome in the future as the procedure matures. So as for BIS research, we have already done a lot of reports on liquid biopsy, and we are trying to keep up with the technological progress. Uh, so in our latest report, the expected CAGR of liquid biopsy uh, in, between 2022 and 2032 is expected to be 19.83%. If we look at the different regions where the technology is being adopted, North America is the highest, has the highest market share. The rest of the regions like Europe, Asia, Pacific, Latin America, Middle East, and rest of the world, even though they don't have a high market share right now, but um, in the coming years, uh, we can see that it has a high growth rate, high CAGR of more than 15%, which means in the forecast period of 2022 and 2032, these markets are, these countries are supposed to adopt the technology very quickly. So in the coming years, liquid biopsy is expected to mature as a market and also become one of the leading techniques when it comes to cancer screening. Uh, so here we have the technological landscape of liquid biopsy as an emerging frontier in different technologies. The technologies being used in liquid biopsy right now are next generation sequencing, polymerase chain reaction, other technologies like parser tech, cell search, depth array technology, ICET technology, cancer seek among others. And emerging technologies include CTC chip technology and uh, nano detection technology, among others. Uh, however, like Azit also said, NGS technology is expected to dominate the liquid biopsy market. NGS has revolutionized the field of precision medicine since it has gotten affordable and is doing the same for liquid biopsy now. According to BIS research liquid biopsy report, NGS is expected to have a market value of 14 $43.5 million in 2021 and grew to have a revenue of $11,118.3 million in 2032. So here we have a pyramid showing the top players in the liquid biopsy market right now. Most of the players, as you can see, are big biopharmaceutical country companies like Kaigen, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Gardent, and Roche, uh, which hold a market share of greater than 7%. Companies like Illumina, Eurofins, LabCorp, and Neogenomics hold a market share ranging from 5 to 7% in the overall liquid biopsy market, and the rest of the companies in the bottom shelf of the pyramid share, hold a market share of less than 5% in the overall liquid biopsy market. But as you can see, most of the companies are big biopharmaceutical companies all ready to jump in and take over the liquid biopsy market. So this was all from my side. And now, Nitish, I'll give you the control and I would like you to take over the disc uh, discussion further. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Thank you, Doctor. Can you show the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ria. And thank you, Doctor Ajit. Uh, so, uh, uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, I'm going to talk about something around the liquid biopsy market dynamics, wherein uh, I'm going to discuss about what is the, the the areas, what are the forces that are driving the liquid biopsy market. And of course, one of the areas that is uh, that we have analyzed within the liquid biopsy market, which is emerging and is emerging at a very high pace, is exosome-based liquid biopsy, or you can say the extracellular-based liquid biopsy. So let's talk about the market dynamics. 
So uh, I was discussing about the market dynamics. What all are the forces that are really responsible for driving this market? So if I talk about the most important factors, these are the rising prevalence of cancer, need for early cancer detection and the increased research funding. So when we talk about the rising prevalence of cancer, we have analyzed the last three decade data where and we what we have analyzed that the cancer deaths have increased tremendously and it accounts for more than 75 percent in between 1990 and 2019 and the second most important driving factor for this market is need for early cancer detection and yeah i think this is one of the factor that uh, that most of the scientists most of the companies are fo focusing on and even most of the research institutions are focusing on so early cancer detection can save a lot of life um, for instance if you look at the prostate cancer data so prostate cancer data has a 100% five year survival rate in stage one, two and three. While if you look at the stage four data, the five year survival rate falls drastically to 87%. Similarly, if you look at the re increased research funding over the past four and a five years, so we have an we at BIS research have analyzed this data and we concluded that there is a market increase of 66 percent between 2019 and 2021 for the research funding so when we say research funding that includes um, the funding by the institutes like national cancer institute the funding by uh, academic institution the funding by venture capitalist everything that accounts for the liquid biopsy with this uh, i would like to sh show you a very interesting data for NSCLC cancer wherein uh, how liquid biopsy be a game changer for basically in the early cancer detection. So if you look at the stage one data, right? This is stage one data for the two year survival rate and five year survival rate. So here the two year survival rate is approximately 97% at stage one and the five year survival rate is 90%. Parallelly, if you look at the stage three data, which has decreased drastically to 30% and 12% for the five year survival rate and similarly for stage four. So if you look at this data, this really shows the importance of early cancer detection, right? And, and, and with this, we have analyzed the current clinical trials that are ongoing currently and that are active in the present scenario. So we have analyzed close to 327 liquid biopsy active trials wherein what we basically uh, concluded that lung cancer and breast cancer followed by colorectal cancer are dominating this clinical trial space. So when we say lung cancer, why, why lung cancer is like why there is a um, need for detection of lung cancer because lung cancer is a cancer wherein basically tissue sampling becomes a substantial challenge right and when even when you isolate uh let's say for the tissue biopsy if you even uh, um, isolate a tissue sample dissected a tissue that is not really uh, sometimes happened there were instances wherein the tissue sample of patient was not sufficient to represent the pathological profile of the primary tumor so that, that is one one area like i can say with the uh, with the data and whatever data we have analyzed in the past uh, three or four years that lung cancer is one of the dominating area in the liquid biopsy space right uh, and if i talk about the funding as we have uh, like I talked about increased research funding. So when we look at the data of National Cancer Institute with respect to oncology, so th this data is with respect to oncology, wherein from 2015 to 2019, there has been a significant increase in allocation of budget for oncology research. Similarly, if you look at the graph on the right hand side, wherein I have given an analysis of different types of indication within the oncology space for 2020 wherein uh, breast cancer funding was dominated followed by lung cancer so the, you can see there is a hardly a, a difference between breast cancer and lung cancer and these are the two areas wherein a lot of lot of uh, funding is going on in terms of uh, um, uh, government in terms of companies so there are there were instances in 2022 like Freenom is a company. I would like to give you an example here. Freenom is a company wherein uh, Freenom 
basically raised more than 1 billion funding or basically they have passed the 1 billion funding in 2022. Uh, similarly, there was a company called Inivata. They have raised close to 29 million of uh, funding, 29 million uh, pound funding in 2021, basically for the liquid biopsy. So uh, all the companies, all the emerging players in this market, they are raising a lot of fund. They are investing a lot just to develop a very precise technique or technology to detect the cancer at a very early stage. I just remember a company called name is Micronoma, which is working on microbiome based liquid biopsy, and they have done a tremendous job in, in isolating or uh, deriving a microbiome based uh, product through which you can detect the early cancer. Now, my next area of discussion is the EV based liquid biopsy, or you can say the exosome based liquid biopsy. So what we have observed like in the last three or four years, EV based or exosome based liquid biopsy is one of the emerging area within the liquid, liquid biopsy. And why I'm saying this, because there were certain challenges that are associated with CTC, circulating tumor cells, and CTDNA. If I talk about the challenges associated with CTC is, of course, the enrichment of CTC. So the, the number of CTC that are being released from a tumor is very less, or in terms of biomarker, if I talk about, they have a very limited, uh, uh, you can say, presence in the blood. In the initial stage, I'm talking about the initial stage. However, if I, if I talk about CTDNA, CTDNA is quite very, they have a very short half-life, less than one hour. So, all, but their abundance is high. So still, it's also causing a challenge in detection of CTDNA and CTC. That's why uh, the scientist and the researcher came with this concept of EV-based liquid biopsy. So, uh, if I talk about the present scenario, the present market that we have estimated for EV based liquid biopsy is close to 50.3 million in 2021. And of course, the market is going growing at a very high pace. And of course, it's approximately 20% that the market is growing currently. And it will reach around 385 million in 2032. So these predictions that we have made, made are based on certain factors, certain parameters. One of the parameters that you can see here, the growing number of publication in terms of the exosome based liquid biopsy. So if you look at the data here, you can analyze that from 2010 to 2015, there were not no more, uh, no more research regarding or you no know, more publication in terms of exosome and liquid biopsy. But from 2016 to 2019, there has been a significant increase. And if you look at this peak, Right in 2018, they, they, that have passed all the research that had uh, taken place uh, with respect to exosomes. So yeah, I can say that it's one of the area that is growing at a very fast pace. And to overcome the challenges that are associated with CTC and CTDNA, uh, I, I believe that EV based uh, or exosome based liquid biopsy can overcome that. Uh, if I talk about the development that had taken place in this. Uh, space specifically to uh, EV based liquid biopsy. Uh, I can say the bi Biotechne is one of the companies that is growing at a very fast pace because they have acquired exosome diagnostic in 2019, right? And similarly, they have also got the FDA um, uh, breakthrough approval of their um, uh, liquid biopsy test for prostate cancer. Similarly, uh, Biosept is a company which get, uh, they have announced the launch of its new liquid biopsy test for lung cancer using the extracellular vesicles, right? And of course, Natera is one of the emerging companies in liquid biopsy. They have also started developing a genetic testing uh, product for uh, cancer using the EVs. So th these developments certainly indicate that there is a lot of uh, um, uh, potential in, in, this, in, in this space of uh, liquid biopsy, right? But yeah, there are a lot, a lot more things still going to happen. There is a, a need of clinical validation and and clinical research, uh, certainly to get into the diagnostic space, right? Now, with this slide, I would like to uh, explain you, like, if you look at the whole ecosystem of the liquid biopsy market, it's 
holding around 2.5 billion right and out of 2.5 billion market in 2020 2.5 billion dollars only the 2% market which is very less if i if i compare the scenario of ev based liquid biopsy it's very less it's just the 2% and within that 2% the major players like biotechnia natera biobiodiga anybody and biosep are uh, playing a major role however there are companies who are also emerging in the ev space is enrich ams bio mosla bio and system biosciences so what these emerging players are doing currently so one of the biggest challenge that ev is facing is the isolation and purification of exosomes right and so these emerging what we have analyzed these emerge all emerging all four and um, maybe there are other companies as well like acuma clara biotech nodality so they all are working on developing a improved method for isolating and purifying exosomes from bodily fluids and also they are looking for funding and support for the development and commercialization of assays so these are the areas that of course um, uh, vc and and other investor can look at right with this if we if we analyze the ev based liquid biopsy in terms of different oncology indication you can see here also um, approximately 30% of chunk is being taken by lung cancer followed by breast cancer and prostate cancer so these are the three areas wherein uh, people can invest people can look for uh, the further validation of data for the products you, they can pitch to the fda and other stuff right uh these are the certain roadblocks that we have identified in terms of diagnostic versus research use only right uh, basically in that option of the current roadblocks in that option of ev based liquid biopsy as i told you earlier that isolation and purification is one of the challenge then of course the standardization and uncertain reimbursement and regulatory policies so these are the biggest challenge in terms of adoption in diagnostic area and if i talk about the research part right so lack of consensus on biomarkers so still there is a challenge that there is a lot of biomarkers in the liquid biopsy space and they have like all the scientists and researchers have to make uh consensus to basically develop any assay that can be used in different settings and second uh, second roadblock for research is use only is analysis of evs right um, I, I which means that researchers need to use a highly sensitive and specific methods for analyzing the genetic material within the evs so ev holds all type of genetic material as we all know proteins dna and rna right and which can be technically expensive and challenging uh, so with this uh, i will open the panel um, for any questions that you have so these are the certain reports that we have published uh, from 2019 right so uh, within the liquid biopsy space right so these are the research study proprietary to liquid biopsy oh, sorry proprietary to bis research so uh, we have covered middle east latin america uh, global study we have also a study on mrd testing uh, and we have also published a study on minimally invasive technolo biopsy technologies uh, over to yuria so now i'm opening the panel for discussions so if uh, any of you have any questions you can just type in the question and answer session and uh, type in the speak the speaker you want the question is the question for so if it's for nitish or azit and then i'll pass on the question to them also nikita has posted on chat uh, about our about bis research and where you can get our reports from so you can if you want to see our tocs or samples you can just download the link from here and reach out to us um so can i ask you a question uh, nitish 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, sure. So yeah. Um, so when you presented this data of uh, EVs, uh, um, and yeah, we can uh, on EVs versus uh, other C, uh, biopsy, uh, other methods of liquid biopsies, and you showed that EVs have taken over uh, liquid biopsy. So uh, is it in terms of uh, uh, clinical uh, aspects, or it's just a plain uh, research aspects that you were presenting? Um, it's in terms of publications, or were you looking at the clinical uh, uh, usage of EVs? Sure, sure. Rajiv. So basically, uh, what we have analyzed, like there were certain products in the market, right? They are for some, some are for research use only, right? So they are being there in the market, but none of the product in the EV space have been uh, approved for, you can say, the clinical purpose. So all the products that are presently available in the market are just for the research use only, and they are being used by the researchers. So yeah, based on those product revenue, we have estimated the market. Okay, so basically it's mostly research based, but because yeah, no, I mean prostate cancer, as you rightly mentioned, the, there was this company in uh, Massachusetts acquired by Biotechne had uh, developed that protocol of uh, using EVs uh, for. That's the only thing I know of. I mean, I have done some research on it and realized the limitations, as you rightly mentioned, the isolation of EVs is a technically uh, a big challenge. Uh, there's no uh, sta standard uh, easy way to sort of isolate EVs uh, in a quick time, and you cannot scale it up uh, to the clinical levels that is required. Um, so it, it definitely is a it's a much bigger uh, bottleneck for EVs to become a clinically acceptable uh, sample uh, sample uh, uh, to be uh, sort of me measured. There are many other research. For example, I can tell you from my own personal experience, we were uh, trying to look at the RNA. Um, uh, in uh, uh, in these EVs, uh, and these are mostly small RNAs, uh, it's called miRNAs, and there are a lot of uh, unannotated RNA species that we were seeing, um, and we don't know their, what their nature is, why they are there, what they do. Um, there are some publications suggesting that those could be uh, markers could be uh, good markers to sort of look at, but they are still un unannotated and what the roles are is also not known. Um, so people need to sort of do this research, annotate those, what those are, uh, those things are. There's a group in uh, uh, Mount Sinai, I guess, uh, who had published a good research on some of those unannotated in which Gustavo Stolowitzki, who is a semaphore C CSO, uh, was part of that study, he had shown that they annotated some of those markers and. Mm -hmm. found out, uh, I think, uh, in some gastro cancers, uh, they uh, linked those markers to gas gastro and related cancers. Um, so yeah, no, it's a very promising uh, um, uh, marker, uh, but the yeah, bottleneck is how do you purify those? Uh, and these are very tiny amounts. I mean, I can tell you the challenge was that you had to have uh, quite a bit of uh, plasma to begin with. To isolate very few. I mean, you couldn't. You can measure. I mean, you, the amount of RNA that you get, you can't even measure them uh, with the traditional methods of measuring nucleic acids. Uh, so you had to sort of uh, blindly go and make your libraries. Mm. Um, so right, yeah, right. Yeah. Certainly, I agree with you. Uh, still, a lot of research is still. Uh, going to happen in the EV space, right? Exosome. But the um, the most important, uh, I can say, one thing that I have analyzed the abundance. If you look at uh, any patient, right? Any any cancer patient, uh, ten percent of uh, I can say the ten percent of circulating exosome in a cancer patient uh, would be like a tumor derived exosomes. So that is. Uh, 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 one area, right? Uh, you can say one of the um, um, benefits of um, going through this EV-based liquid biopsy, right? And of course, there is a challenge. It's still a challenge in isolating that you and we have already discussed. But yeah, if when we talk about the companies like uh, um, this uh, Mursala Bio and and uh, there were companies, there were emerging companies like Ecular was there they all are all what we have analyzed they all are working on currently they are working on developing a robust method for the isolation and and, and purification of evs 
So once they have like they have developed that, probably that is going to uh, be a revolution in this space. And certainly we can see certain products in the market that can get FDA approval in the next two years or maybe uh, one year. So a lot of uh, uh, I can say uh, efforts are people are putting efforts in this space. Right. Right. Yeah, no, it's a, it is it is a yeah, emerging field of liquid biopsy. Yeah, there are many things. I mean, for example, uh, uh, so the data I presented was mostly on CT DNA and its uh, monitoring, but I showed you some of the glimpses of how it can be uh, uh, how it can pick up early stage cancer. So we developed many other uh, methods. So mutation based methods have uh, limitations and. Uh, detecting early cancers. So what people now are doing are based on uh, looking at uh, epigenetic changes. So uh, uh, epigenetic markers, for example, methylation patterns. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, um, that's uh, becoming a more uh, promising in terms of uh, detecting cancers. So for example, all the grails, all the uh, gardens or frenome, uh, they are relying on epigenetic uh, markers at the same time fragmentation pattern. So there are a lot of other information that they are trying to include in this bio liquid biopsy field and come up with a uh, uh, combination of marker uh, or features of the uh, DNA um, that can be sort of put together to uh, inform whether you have a cancer or not, or the fragments that you are seeing is coming out of uh, from a tumor and is a predictive marker of cancer or not. So um, because of the limitation, there are biological limitations. Uh, for example, our cancers, they don't shed equal amount of uh, early, early when they are, uh, the cancer is in early stages, uh, the, the uh, presence of these markers in blood becomes a challenge. There are biological challenges right. to it. Yeah, that's I, I believe uh, that's that's the biggest challenge, the earlier early cancer detection and, and the presence, the abundance of presence of these biomarkers in the early stage. Mm -hmm. And let's see what what is going next in the uh, in this space. And, and certainly uh, <laughs> we can connect over something new. Or we can do something. Maybe uh, we can do a webinar on EV based liquid biopsy <laughs> next time. So uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, with this, uh, uh, I would like to pass the uh, things to Ria and Ria can conclude that. So yeah, now if you have any more questions, you can share them on hello at bisresearch.com and we'll get back to you. And if you have any questions for Azit as well, uh, we'll share, pass on the questions to him then. So uh, I think we can conclude the session now. Uh, before we go, I'll quickly introduce all of you to Insight Monk. It's a, it is a platform that our company has created. It's a, it has a, it is an online platform where everyone can connect. So it, all experts from all of all the fields around the world can connect at one platform, and you get access to our healthcare market intelligence reports and the market statistics you can buy reports from there directly and you get the toc sample summaries there and uh, we have a, a huge network of, of experts consultants as well where you can just uh, request a consultation and the consultant would get back to you uh, of any field so we have uh, this is regarding our healthcare field other than that there are um, uh, fields like agri tech uh, space and everything so you can check out this website from this link insightmong.com it is uh, an ai based pretty good platform that we are uh, preparing in our company so that uh, so with that i would like to conclude the session today and uh, uh, so thank you for joining everyone you can post your questions if you have any at hello at bisresearch.com. So thank you for joining. See you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Azid. Thank you, Azid, for yeah, for your yeah, time. Yeah thanks. yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting for this talk and uh, good luck with all your efforts there. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, pleasure.